epileptic fits, which explains the curiosity of the murders. In the files, it said that the eyewitnesses said that he had a peculiar gait. He was weak at the knees and wasn't fully extending his legs. When he walked, he had a kind of shuffling gait, which is probably a side effect of some brain damage as a result of his epilepsy. The Jack the Ripper murders stopped in late 1888, and Hyams was arrested by was arrested just seven weeks after the Mary Kelly murder, with him being deemed a wandering lunatic by police, and the murder stopped after that. He was locked up in the Colney Hatch Lunatic Asylum in North London in 1889 until his death in 1913. So now some more about his background. He was raised in Mitre Street, just off Mitre Square, where Catherine Eddowes was murdered, another victim. Oh, Catherine Eddowes' body was found immediately outside the back window of number 8 Mitre Street, a business, a business run by Mr. Taylor in 1888, but which in 1861 had been operated as a cigar manufacturing business by Hyam Hyams' uncle, Louis Levy. According to Horton, Hyams had previously been on the list of potential killers, like I said, but he had never or he had, quote, never before been fully explored as a Ripper suspect, because apparently he'd been misidentified. And she went on to say about that, quote, When I was trying to identify the correct time Hyams, I found about five. It took quite a lot of work to identify his correct biographical data. Who knew Hyam Hyams was such a common name? So he was born in Aldgate on February 8th, 1855, to Fanny and Solomon Hyams, who, according to the 1871 census, was also a cigar maker. By the 1881 census, Solomon Hyams was no longer part of the household, and Hyam Hyams, who was 26 at that time, was living at number 29 Mitre Street, Aldgate, with his mother, three brothers, Barney, George, and Morris, and two sisters named Clara and Jane, and Jane's husband, John Abrahams. Hyams' occupation was listed as fruiterer, whatever that is. Sometime after 1881, Hyam Hyams married a woman named Rachel, and by 1888, the year of the Jack the Ripper murders, the couple had two children, a son named William and a newborn daughter named Kate. At about 6 a.m. on the morning of December 29th, 1888, Hyams was arrested by a member of the Metropolitan Police in Lemon Street, Whitechapel, and sent to the Whitechapel Workhouse Infirmary. His condition was diagnosed as delirium tremens, which is a disordered state of mind usually accompanied by hallucinations and terrifying delusions brought on by severe alcoholism. At that time, his address was listed as 217 Jubilee Street, Mile End. Hyams was discharged after 13 days on January 11th, 1889, but he was readmitted to the Whitechapel Workhouse Infirmary three months later on April 15th, 1889. He was admitted from 4 Belcourt Lane and listed as being married, 34 years old, and with his occupation listed as a general dealer, whatever that is. He was also listed as having a, quote, weak mind. He was transferred the same day to the, col to the Colney Hatch Lunatic Asylum and arrived, quote, under restraint and in a noisy condition. At Colney Hatch, he was described as, quote, violent and dangerous, especially to wife, injured mother's head with chopper when attacking his wife, epileptic and irritable after fits, addicted to drink. On August 30th, 1889, after four and a half months, Himes was discharged from Colney Hatch as being recovered, but only ten days later, on the 9th of September, he was admitted to the City of London Lunatic Asylum at Stone, Kent, as a insane person. After attacking and stabbing his wife, interestingly, he was, he was described as being, quote, the terror of the City of London police. According to the case notes, Himes' wife had stated that she had f four miscarriages. Because of her husband's increasingly deranged behavior, he thought that she was cheating on him, like I said, I think, and that for the past nine years he'd suffered from periodic epile epileptic attacks and was becoming progressively more violent. He was said to practice self-abuse, which apparently is just masturbating, and was previously addicted to drink. However, it was also noted that, quote, at times 
times he was kind, civil, and industrious, and most attentive to his personal appearance and grooming. Four months later, on January 4th, 1890, Haim Himes was transferred back to the Colney Hatch Asylum as patient number 10,757. His case notes stated, quote, very frequent epileptic fits and then very violent and filthy, otherwise quiet but bitter against wife. Apparently these fits were cyclical and Himes would be well for about a month and then, quote, on off for a fortnight. I guess having seizures on and off. He was described as a, quote, crafty and dangerous maniac who, quote, destroys his bedding and paints his walls with filth, shouts the most obscene language, and practices self-abuse. His delusions about his wife cheating on him went on, and he suspected that the medical officers at the asylum were having affairs with her. He would sing and cry and, quote, hope that God would take him. At one point, he asked for a knife so that he could kill himself, but when he was able to get his hands on a piece of sharp steel, he used it instead to attack one of the medical personnel by cutting his neck, although not seriously. Throughout his time in the asylum, Zahims was described as being, quote, violent, threatening, noisy, and destructive, and was said to have attacked other patients and medical staff. I basically said that already, but it does go to show that he was a violent person. Whether he chose to be or not is another issue, but... That certainly does lend itself to, uh, disemboweling people. Himes appeared twice in the 1891 census, being listed as being an inmate of the Colony Hatch Asylum, as HH35, cigar maker, insane, and also living at 40 New Street, Gravel Lane, Aldgate as Haim Himes, 37, cabinet maker. As Himes never again left Colney Hatch after, his, after being taken there in January 1890, it's likely that him being listed that way was wishful thinking on his wife's part, who probably dreamed that one day her husband would be cured and come back home. Haim Himes died in Colney Hatch Lunatic Asylum on the 22nd of March, 1913. Epilepsy and cardiovascular degeneration were listed as the causes of death. So, that's the evidence for Haim Himes being Jack the Ripper. The evidence against it is that there's no DNA evidence that can prove it, which I mean, obviously, but... And Haim Himes didn't fit some of the descriptions given by Jack the Ripper witnesses. Some of them said that he was older, taller, and had a different accent, different hair color, etc. Though, most the majority of the descriptions did list a 30... 40 year old and Haim Himes was 33 at the time, 5'7, and probably had an East End London accent, having grown up there. So, I was reading through the descriptions of some of the eyewitnesses, and honestly, like, maybe I just didn't read them right or whatever, but pretty much all of them were different. Like, there weren't that many descriptions that described the exact same person. So, despite Horton's discovery making headlines like it's new, over like the last week, um, which I guess is just from the physical descriptions of the way that he moved and everything in the asylum files about, you know, him from when he was there. He's actually mentioned in books about Jack the Ripper from 1987, 1996, and 2004. So the idea of him being a suspect obviously isn't new, but yeah, it's new to me. <laughs> So I do think that the evidence is pretty compelling, like with the way he walked and stuff. And you know, obviously his demeanor being epileptic and having a violent temperament after fits. Obviously being epileptic doesn't make you go out and disempower people, but maybe if it's untreated, I don't know. I'm sure he wasn't having a good time. Could be him. Maybe it's not. Who's to say? And so as I was reading about this, and like trying to look things up, I found out that Jack the Ripper's true identity had been discovered before this time, and it was pretty recent, back in like 2014, I think, but then it came back up again in 2019. Um, and he was thought to be a Polish barber who had immigrated to England. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit now, just cause it's also interesting. So in March 2019, forensic scientists in England published genetic tests in the Journal of Forensic Sciences that pointed to Aaron Kosminski, a 23-year-old Pol Polish, I almost said Polish,
Polish, Polish barber and prime police suspect at the time, who died in an asylum in 1990. Ironically, it was also Colney Hatch, where uh, I Am I Am's was. Maybe they knew each other. Kosminski had previously been named as a possible suspect, but this is the first time that supporting DNA evidence has been published in a peer-reviewed journal. The DNA came from a silk shawl that was stained with blood and semen that investigators had said was found next to Catherine Edo's body, who was Jack the Ripper's fourth victim. Obviously, the semen is assumed to be Jack's, but other than the fact that it seems likely, there's really no way to prove it. You know that it belonged to Jack the Ripper. They proved that it belonged to Aaron Kosminski, so, supposedly, but... Anyway. The shawl was never washed, and descendants of the officer who found it kept it safe until they decided to sell it in an auction in 2007, for some reason, to an author named Russell Edwards, who is a self-proclaimed armchair detective and author of the book Naming Jack the Ripper, published in 2014, which featured the then-unpublished DNA test results from the shawl. Oh, I meant to mention um, that Susan Horton lady also I think is writing a book about Maya Mimes being Jack the Ripper. I forget what it's called, but I'm sure if you Google it, it'll come right up if you're interested. Um, I'm sure she talks a lot more in depth about the evidence that she found that makes her think that he was in fact Jack the Ripper. But yeah. So, quote, I've got the only piece of forensic evidence in the whole history of the case. Uh, Russell Edwards told a newspaper in, back in 2014, I've spent 14 years working on it, and we have definitely solved the mystery of who Jack the Ripper was. Edwards gave the shawl to a person named, I don't know if it's Jari or Yari, Luhelainen, an expert in molecular biology, and they used fragments of mitochondrial DNA, which comes solely from the mother's genes. Llewellyn and Edwards said that that DNA led them to identify the killer as Kosminski, and they compared it to DNA samples taken from his living descendants. They also used DNA from the blood on the shawl and compared it to Edo's living uh, descendants to verify that it was really hers. Quote, on the testing, the first result showed a 99.2% match. Since the DNA has two complementary strands, we went on and tested the other DNA strand, which gave a perfect 100% match. Uh, Luhelainen. Luhelainen. I'm probably not saying that right. Told the Liverpool Echo newspaper in 2014. The analysis also showed that the killer had brown hair and brown eyes, which agrees with the evidence from an eyewitness. Though honestly, I read one of the eyewitness statements that said he had red hair. I think that person thought that he was Irish. They said he had an Irish accent and red hair. Quote, these characteristics are surely not unique, the authors admit in the paper, but said that blue eyes are now more common than brown in England. I don't know what that means, because you'd think that, uh, Oh, I guess they're saying the majority of people in England have blue eyes instead of brown. But I feel like that's, uh, not accurate. <laughs> that's just my hunch, though. But there could have been millions of brown-eyed people wandering around in 1888, so I really wondered if that was true, because, like, there are a lot of people who immigrated from various different countries, and blue eyes are not the most common eye color. I mean, in Northern Europe, sure, but not... Well, I don't know, maybe like in Eastern Europe too, but a lot of immigrants were like Jewish or Eastern European or probably even like from India or something like that. So I feel like there would have been a lot of immigrants around at that time and a lot of them would have had brown eyes and brown hair or black hair. So anyway, critics of the evidence say key details on the specific genetic variants identified and compared between DNA samples were not included in the paper, and they also questioned whether the shawl is actually viable evidence, saying there's no proof it was ever at the crime scene, and that it might have been contaminated over the years. To be honest, even if the shawl was at the crime scene and belonged to Catherine Meadows, the semen could have been from one of her clients from earlier in the night, or a previous night. There's really no way to prove that it actually came from Jack the Ripper. To refute the idea that it's shady that they didn't put the specific genetic information in their paper, the author 
said that the paper was subject to the Data Protection Act, which is an act in the UK that, um, I didn't read about it, but it sounds like it's probably sort of like HIPAA, like it protects people's information. So they couldn't publish the DNA sequences of the living relatives of Eros and Kisminski, which of course is how they proved that the DNA belonged to them in the first place. Instead of that, they put a visual representation of the DNA sequences that I think was like colored blocks that overlapped between what was on the shawl and the living relative's DNA. And they said that, that it was easier for non-experts to understand that graphic. Which, like, I mean, yeah, probably, but... Kind of arrogant, <laughs> am I right? A forensic scientist at the Institute of Legal Medicine at Innsbruck Medical University in Austria argued that publishing mitochondrial DNA sequences wouldn't threaten the descendants' privacy at all, and the author should have included them in the paper. Quote, otherwise the reader cannot judge the result. I wonder where science and research are going when we start to avoid showing results, but instead put, present colored boxes. Another expert in mitochondrial DNA, also at Innsbruck, named Hansi Wiesensteiner, also had a problem with the mitochondrial DNA analysis, stating that it can only reliably show that people or two DNA samples are not related. So it can't prove that they're, that samples come from two related people. It can only prove that they, they come from non-related people. Quote, based on mitochondrial DNA, one can only exclude a suspect. And so I'm going to talk about Kosminski's background now, just because, you know, why not, right? So, investigators back in 1888 referred to Kosminski as, quote, a Polish Jew who lived in the very heart of the district where the murders were committed. He had become insane owing to many indulgence in solitary vices. He had a great hatred of women and strong homicidal tendencies and was, and I believe still is, de detained in a lunatic asylum about March 1889. This man in appearance strongly resembled an individual seen by the city PC near Mitre Square. The city PC being a cop, I guess. I don't really know what PC stands for, but I think it's a type of cop. Sir Robert Anderson, one of the investigators, had first dropped a hint in 1901 that the police knew the identity of Jack the Ripper in an article called Punishing Crime, writing, quote, Jack the Ripper was safely caged in an asylum. He made that claim again in 1907 in his book Criminals and Crime, and expanded on it a little bit more in 1910 in his memoir, The Lighter Side of My Official Life, saying, quote, I will merely add that the only person who ever had a good view of the murderer unhesitatingly identified the suspect the instant he was confronted with him. In saying that he was a Polish Jew, I am merely stating a definitely ascertained fact. In 1987, Chief Inspector Donald Swanson's personal copy of Anderson's book was made public, which included Swanson's handwritten notes in the margins and end paper. And Swanson wrote, quote, After the suspect had been identified at the seaside home where he had been sent by us with difficulty in order to subject him to identification, and he knew he was identified. On suspects returned to his brother's house in Whitechapel, he was watched by police city CID by day and night. In a very short time, the suspect, with his hands tied behind his back, was sent to Stepney Workhouse and then to Colney Hatch, where he died shortly afterwards. Kosminski was the suspect. Aaron Kosminski was suspected of being Jack the Ripper by three of the officers involved, Sir Melville, McNaughton, Sir Robert Anderson and Chief Inspector Donald Swanson. Kosminski was born in 1865, though exactly where is not known, though it's thought that it was probably in Russia. He came to England with his sisters and their family in 1882, though mine is his mother and father, since there's no evidence that they ever came to England. Kosminski was a hairdresser, though apparently he hadn't had a job as one for years. On July 12, 1890, he was taken from his brother Wolf's house at 3 Scion Square, Commercial Road East, and admitted to the Mile End Down Workhouse Infirmary. It was noted there that he had been insane for two years. After three days, he was discharged into the care of his brother, whose address is given as 16 Greenfield Street, which 
which is actually the address of his brother-in-law, apparently, Morris Lipnowski. Kosminski was readmitted on February 4th, 1891 from 16 Greenfield Street, where Dr. Ochin examined him and said that Kosminski, quote, believed he was guided and controlled by an instinct that informed his mind, that he claimed to know the movements of all mankind and compulsively self-abused himself, which again is masturbating. Three days later, he was moved to Colney Hatch Lunatic Asylum. When he was admitted to Colney Hatch, it was said that, quote, he goes about the streets and picks up bits of bread from the gutter and eats them. He drinks water from a standpipe and refuses food at the hands of others. He is very dirty and will not be washed. On April 13, 1894, he was transferred to Leavesden Asylum for Imbeciles, a large asylum that had housed 1,600 inmates at one point. I'm sure the conditions were amazing. He stayed there until he died at the age of 54 on March 24, 1919, from gangrene in his left leg. He was buried on March 27th at East Ham Cemetery. So, there is some doubt about Anderson and McNaughton's statements, since McNaughton referred to a city PC near Mitre Square on September 30th, the night of the double murder, but no police officer actually saw Catherine Eddowes with the killer. The only witness who did and gave a description was Joseph Londe. Londe, who wasn't a cop at all. The only cop that saw one of the victims with a man on the night she was murdered was Constable William Smith, who isn't a city PC. Anderson also wrote that the only person who ever got a good view of the murderer identified the suspect the instant he was shown him, but refused to give evidence against him out of Jewish solidarity, because, um, that person was Jewish, but Constable Smith, who saw the suspect, was not Jewish. So that leaves Joseph Landy as the only witness, but he said that he only got a glimpse of the man with Catherine Eddowes, and that he wasn't sure he'd be able to identify him again. The first seaside home where it was said by Anderson that the identification took place didn't open until March 1890 in Hove, and Kosminski was not incarcerated at the asylum until February 1891, so he couldn't have been arrested in March 1890, and it would have had to be in 1891. Also, since Londi only got a glimpse of the man and doubted he would recognize him again, it doesn't make sense that he would have identified him with certainty 15 months after the fact, making it unlikely that Joseph Londi was actually Anderson's witness. Londi was with two men the night they saw Jack the Ripper, Harry Harris and Joseph Hyam Levy, who isn't Hyam Hyam's uncle, he was Lewis Levy. Harris didn't notice Catherine or the man with her, so he couldn't say anything about what he looked like, and he didn't give any statement to the police about that. Levy became distressed by the couple for some unknown reason, which led people to speculate that it was because he recognized and knew the man and that he was Anderson's witness. Levy was called to the inquest, but was unable to give a description, though the press were suspicious as to the extent of what Levy actually saw or knew. It was the same Joseph I. M. Levy who supported the naturalization application of Martin Kosminski, though despite um, the fact that it wasn't a super common name, there hasn't actually been an established connection between Martin Kosminski and Jack the Ripper suspect Aaron Kosminski. There haven't been found a lot of records about Aaron Kosminski from the asylum, but what there is is that it says that in 1915 he was described as being slight in stature and light in build, his weight given as under eight stone, whatever that means. And even though his weight had slowly decreased as he spent time in the asylum, he was described as being in good health, which suggests that he was always slight in stature. Aaron Kosminski was 23 years old at the time of the Whitechapel murders, not in his 30s or 40s, the way Jack the Ripper was described as being. Kosminski doesn't fit the, the um, descriptions of Jack the Ripper at all, pretty much. Elizabeth Darrell described a suspect over 40 years of age, while William Marshall described a short, stout suspect. He was short, but uh, I guess he wasn't stout. Israel Schwartz described a broad-shouldered suspect about 30 years old. Marianne Cox described a suspect about 36 years old. And finally, George Hutchinson also described a suspect between 
34 and 35 years of age, which like I said is how old Haim Himes was, and he was 5'7 as well. I don't know about stoutness though, but Kosminski was also free for nearly two years after the murder of Mary Kelly. So if he wasn't incarcerated, why, and he was Jack the Ripper, why did he just stop for two years? In addition to that, there's no evidence that Kosminski, Kos, Kosinski, have I been, wait, okay, I have his name written down as either Kosinski or Kosminski, whichever, I think it's supposed to be Kosminski, and I just started writing Kosinski instead by accident, but, um, anyway, so there was no evidence that he had any kind of anatomical knowledge or had any kind of violent, suicidal, or homicidal tendencies, and he was not considered a danger to other people at any time during this stay in the asylum. The Mile End Workhouse Infirmary declared that he had been insane for two years, and so the onset of his illness started before the Jack the Ripper murders commenced. And this whole thing with uh, Aaron Kosminski wasn't even the first test that had happened with the aim to identify Jack the Ripper from DNA. Several years before that, U.S. crime author Patricia Cornwell asked other scientists to analyze any DNA in samples taken from the letters supposedly sent, to, sent by Jack to the police. Based on that DNA analysis and other clues, she said the killer was the painter Walter Sickert, who was another suspect, though a lot of experts believe that those letters were fake. Another genetic analysis of the letters claimed the murderer could have been a woman, Jill the Ripper, which is a theory that cropped up during the original investigation even, and they basically said that she had to have been a midwife, or maybe an abortionist, which would explain the anatomical know-how, the knife skills, and the ability to walk around covered in blood without people thinking it was suspicious. To be honest, when I was reading about that, I thought it was pretty, it sounded pretty viable as a theory. But yeah, I don't know. So, since I usually do Japanese videos, I thought I'd throw in a little bit of Japanese knowledge at the end here and say that if you watch anime, you'll probably have noticed that the Japanese have a bit of an obsession with Jack the Ripper, since he appears a lot more often than you'd expect in random different anime, such as the new Record of Ragnarok one. Um, and one of my favorite anime, Golden Kamui, he comes up, along with Jojo Part 1, apparently, which I did not remember. He's mentioned sort of an attack on titan with you know kenny the ripper um and there were a bunch of other ones as well i think one of which was black butler but i'm not sure because i haven't watched that one but anyway so the japanese like jack the ripper um back in the day in the 1800s the case was reported on in japan because well um basically like after the meiji restoration which i think happened in the late 1800s like maybe the 1860s i forget exactly the date um that's when japan sort of opened up to the rest of the world and you know started receiving news stories from the rest of the world and so that's when the jack the ripper murders were happening so they did find out about it i guess um and at the time they called him just jack kusaripa which is obviously just his name with the Japanese accent. But at some point, they decided to give him his own Japanese name. I guess maybe around the time he started featuring in uh, different media and stuff. They sort of made him their own, I guess. Um, and that Japanese name is Kirisaki Jack, which I'm pretty sure means cut and tear Jack, which is accurate. But Jack the Ripper is not the only one from that time who crops up in Japanese media a lot. They bring up Sherlock Holmes, Edgar Allan Poe. In the research that I was doing for this, I actually found an article in the New York Times from, it was headlined, Japan's Jack the Ripper. And it was, I'm gonna read it. So it's from Sunday, January 28th, 1894. Oh, it's a Japanese Jack the Ripper, not Japan's Jack the Ripper, but you get the idea either way. From the London Daily News, Japan has suffered from its Jack the Ripper. Fortunately, he has been captured, and his everyday name turns out to be Kobayashi Mitsuya. At his trial, it was stated that he went to Maebashi about the middle of last year, took up his abode in a cheap lodging house, and prowled about the streets, sometimes as a shampooer, sometimes as an itinerant priest, and sometimes, again, as a deaf-mute beggar. 
in these disguises he became acquainted with the interiors of several houses into which he afterward broke at night. Not content with mere thieving, he began to strangle women in lonely places and mutilate them. The cases proved against him were three, but the murdered women found about the scene of his operations were greatly in excess of this number and led the authorities to the belief that Kobayashi had accomplices. This ruffian will commit no more brutal murders. He has just been executed. So, the New York Times referred to him as Jack the Ripper, but I don't know if the Japanese actually referred to him as Jack the Ripper at all. Um, I found it was interesting that there have been other murderers who've been referred to as Jack the Ripper, which I guess isn't really surprising, but there was one in China named Gao Chengyang, which I probably said wrong, but in India also, Raman Raghav. Maybe I'll do a video on each of them. But yeah, so that's everything for this video. Um, I guess it was a bit different than what I usually do, but I hope you found it interesting. So, I'll be back with another video later. I'm going to be doing um, something a little different next time, too, probably. Well, I don't know if it's going to be the next one I release, but I'm going to do a video putting, like, charms on fake nails. Because I'm going on a trip to South Korea in a couple weeks. Well, in like two weeks, less than two weeks, really. And I don't get to polish my nails ever, see? Not polished. Because <laughs> of where I work, we're not allowed to have polished nails, let alone wear fake ones. So usually if I go on a trip, I'll take that opportunity to wear some nails. And so I bought like a bunch of little rhinestones and stuff, and I'm going to be like gluing them on in different designs. And I'll probably wear like latex gloves just for the sounds from that. And it's just probably just going to be like a whisper ramble, life update kind of video. Um, visual ASMR, I guess, because of the putting on stones thing. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of thing, keep an eye out for it. And yeah. Also, sorry, I've been messing with my hair this whole time. I don't know why, it's like my own personal fidget toy whenever it's curly. <laughs> I just can't not mess with it. <laughs> but yeah, so anyway, I'll see you in my next video.